Hello and welcome to the Sugar Coated Marketing Podcast, where you get sweet advice on how to improve your marketing and grow your business. I am David Paris, your host, and in this podcast series, I interview top experts who give advice on the subjects of marketing, copywriting, advertising, and we even throw in a hint of self-development. And today, we have an awesome interview lined up with Jack Turk. Jack has experience writing for corporations like Microsoft and Kodak and has generated millions of dollars in sales as the head copywriter for Dan Kennedy's company, GKIC. In this interview, Jack shares with us some words of wisdom from Dan, how Jack's experience as a magician helped make him a better copywriter, and we discuss when it's appropriate to use comedy in your sales message. So, Jack, how are you doing? I'm doing excellent today. How are you doing today, David? I'm doing great, and it's great to have you on the show. Well, it's absolutely my pleasure. Yeah, um, so th there was a lot of stuff that we wanted to cover today. Um, one one of the things that I wanted to ask you is that you've, you've had a lot of experience working with and for Dan Kennedy. Um, I, I just wanted to see if you could go over some key takeaways that you have from that experience. All right. Uh, my main uh, experience in working with Dan Kennedy uh, was through my uh, my years at GKIC. I was the head copywriter from 2012 to 2015, so I worked on a variety of projects, uh, some of which Dan was involved with uh, more in-depth than others. Um, the uh, thing that I definitely got from working with Dan, though, is a great respect for his clarity and insight into business as well as just marketing. Uh, that's just the, the key takeaway, at least for me, was just how impressive Dan is through his years of working with businesses to understand business models and the power of a strong business model and the necessity of having a strong business model for your business. The marketing is, is all fantastic as well, but if you don't have a solid underpinning of a real way to make money in your market, then no matter how much marketing you do and how well you do it, it's all going to go for naught. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm glad that you said that because I, I think that that's something that, that can be overlooked sometimes, um, at least from the eyes of marketers, because um, like with my, some of my business experience uh, doing some financial consulting type stuff, uh, which is what I did before I was a copywriter. Um, I have experience going in and, and looking at, at companies and and typically the ones that were doing well had great marketing, but they also had a really solid foundation for business. And it, like it, most of the companies had um, the the business model had been around for a uh, hundred years or more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that was the thing I, the, the, in all the interactions I had with Dan, whether they were, Direct and mostly they were not direct. It was mostly through um, Dad, Dad's very uh, guarded and protective of his time and his personal space. So Dan is extremely careful in filtering information that gets to him and how he gets information and how he presents information. So that Tim, a lot of uh, the interactions I had with Dan were actually were over facts, to be blunt and not necessarily in person. Uh, I had been on a couple calls, I think, with him, but mostly it was primarily back and forth through. We'd send a proposal to Dan, and we get back feedback, oh, you should do this, this, and this, and that, get that kind of direction. Um, I did do some stuff uh, with Dan, uh, you know, personally talking with him in person, but honestly, most of the interaction was uh, kind of that, through that channel he set up to protect his time, which is incredibly important. That's, that's an incredibly important business lesson right there is to be very protective of time, your time and your schedule and who has access to you and who doesn't. Yeah, without question. Um, that, that's actually something that Darren Hardy talks a lot about as well. And I think that that's a trait that you will also find in most people that are successful. Oh, yeah, there's, there's, there's no – we are – he talk, I think Dan calls them time vampires, and there's so many people who just suck the life out of your productivity and your energy level and your enthusiasm for your business and what it is you do by just dropping in unannounced and eating up your time. Uh, it just happens 
to people over and over and over again, you have to be very protective of that. You really do, especially today. And I think that it's a skill that you have to learn, especially with all the things that are coming at you and not, not just people, but, you know, email and phone calls and messages and whatnot. But, um, Moving on, um, you've just released a book, and you've got a really interesting story of how you became a copywriter. So why don't you let everyone know what the title of your book is, and then go a little bit into your background story. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, I just finished this. I've been kicking around this thing for, for like basically a year and a half or so, and the title of the book is 101 Fast, Good, Cheap Hacks to Writing a Killer Sales Letter. And it's essentially a compilation of 101 tips, tricks, strategies, templates, ideas, generators, et cetera, that I've been accumulating over the years as a writer to, able to, to enable me to get stuff done quickly. And I think it's really important as a, as a writer to develop the ability to write fast. Because the faster you can write, the more you can produce, the more you can get stuff out there, have it evaluated either as a success or, you know, maybe not so much of a success, but you learn faster and that way you can move faster. It's better for business if you are producing stuff faster. So that's the reason I wrote the book and hopefully it offers some value to people to be able to get stuff done faster. Yes. And you know what? There was one chapter that stood out to me in particular as a copywriter and it was called How to Get Inside Your Customer's Skin. And in the chapter, you talk about how you shouldn't write any sales letter before you first get inside your customer's skin. Now, I completely agree with you on that. And um, why don't you elaborate a little bit on it? Well, one of the things, there's a, there's a saying, and I, I wish I could come up top of my head, who actually said this. I'm not taking credit for you. You want to enter the conversation going on in your customer's mind with your sales letter. Uh, it might have been Halbert. It might have been uh, uh, John Caples. It might have been, uh, you know, who knows, John Carlson. I, I'm not sure who, who actually said that, but it's a, it's a brilliant insight. And the only way to do that, the only way to enter that conversation is to put yourself inside their skin and walk a few miles in their moccasins, as it were, so you can Feel what they're they're feeling on a daily basis. I think one of the things uh, I learned copywriting as a way to market myself as a magician. We might talk about some of that stuff later, but I was a, uh, a very successful uh, children's entertainer here in the the Northwest in the Seattle area. I was doing 200 to 300 shows a month uh, as a uh, family kids show entertainer, primarily. I'll be honest, uh, that's, that's birthday parties. And, but what got me into understanding and being able to market myself effectively was I got into the head of my target customer. And the target customer, uh, if, I, if you don't mind me going a little deeper into this. No, absolutely. Was, um, okay. Was, it was, I looked on, my target customer was um, a, a professional woman, a mother, who probably had a job. Uh, either in the high tech area industry or just some professional level person um, who's making good money, pro very driven, uh, motivated, love their children, love their kids, just love their kids to pieces, but is you know probably not able to spend all the time they want with their child. Probably feeling like they they want to give them more than they. They love them to pieces. They can't, but they can't do as much for them as they wish, you know. And maybe, maybe there's a little bit of guilt there, you know. I don't know, but maybe there's also a feeling they want to show their love for their child, and when it's their kid's birthday, they're probably uh, kind of freaking out a little bit because they have they've been around, you know, their child, but they're not around a lot of children in a big mass all at once. So I actually kind of compared uh, like a birthday party show to like. Uh, a plumber. So you don't even think about hiring uh, a plumber until like the toilet explodes. And then you really need to hire a plumber. And that's how I wrote, I, I thought of, you know, a mom wanting to hire a birthday party magician. She doesn't, you don't think about a birthday party magician for 365 days a year. You know, it never comes up in your mind until it's Johnny's birthday and you're going to have 35 year olds in your house and you don't know what you're going to do. 
I can do cake and I can do pin the tail on the donkey, but that's not two hours. So they're starting to freak out. So that's what's going on in their head. And they make the decision to search for children's entertainer, Seattle, on the web. And that's what, how I wrote the sales letter on my website to address that specific motion and person and where they're coming from at that moment in time. Yeah, I think you've definitely nailed down the market there, not just in Seattle, but also here in Pittsburgh. And um, you, you and I have talked about this a little bit before, but uh, some of you listening may not know, but I also used to be a magician, but I was a street magician and I did more uh, flashy stuff with, with fire and illusions instead of doing things for children for the exact reasons that you listed as your sales pitch. <laughs> and that was because I wouldn't know what to do with 30 kids either. And when I was a magician, this, this was back when I was in college and um, I actually had two other friends that happened to go to the same school that were also magicians and we would always brainstorm and talk about ideas. And we came up with this one idea that was really successful and that was to go to some local bars and restaurants. And we would take uh, one night of the week that had low traffic, uh, call it Thursday. And then Thursday would become magic night where we would go and perform. And the goal was to advertise magic night and then increase the number of people that would come, which would then increase the sales for that evening. And what we got in return was one, uh, we asked for the rate of $15 an hour just for the first time. And if it didn't work, then we would give them a refund. And then if we hit X number of sales, the, they would give us 10% above and beyond that. And it became a really successful way for us to market ourselves and to get shows and then to also get invited to do shows in people's homes for birthday parties or 4th of July or different events that we met in the restaurant. So it was a really great way to market to the other side. And then it also made the business happy because then they were able to increase more sales and get more traffic. And it worked really well in particular because of the area that we were at in Pittsburgh, because um, for people that aren't familiar with Pittsburgh, you've got the city and then you have 20 miles in every direction around the city of Pittsburgh is, is basically farm country that's uh, largely undeveloped. So it just create a really great dynamic between us and the restaurant and then also the people because we created a nightlife with the people liked, which brought more people into the business, which increased their sales. So they were happy to pay us, but then it also made the people happy. So the people hired us for shows. So it was a win-win-win on all sides. Right. You plugged in something that it's, it's not a matter of trying to convince someone to buy something you have. It's identifying a hole in their life or in their needs and in their desires and their wants and their dreams that they're actively searching for, and you find the perfect thing to plug right in there. And that's why it's so important to really get inside the head of your customer. But if you don't know that, you don't know that, you can't craft the right offer to fit what's going on in their head, what's going on in their heart. Exactly. And, and if you don't know that, you, you can't really – sell them anything. No, you have to convince them. And nobody wants to be convinced of anything. Nope. That's, that's a good way to get people to fight with you pretty quickly. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Check Facebook if you want confirmation of that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, one, of, one of the other steps that you talked about that I thought was really interesting was um, making the prospect imagine joy. Um, I, I love that. And I loved your explanation of it. But would, would you mind sharing with the listeners? Oh. It, it, it kind of boils down to you really want them to – you're not – again, it, there's, an old, there's also an old thing in sales that you're not – if uh, if you're uh, selling quarter-inch drill bit, your customers don't come in to the store to buy a quarter-inch drill bit. They come into the store because they want a quarter-inch hole. And people want the results. I mean, and even so, if they want a quarter-inch hole, what, they, what they're doing is they're probably building a fireplace. To say they're building a fire. So what in selling that drill bit, you're not selling a drill bit. You're selling sitting around the living room, the family room with the kids at Christmas with the with the lights and the, the music going 
and the smell of popcorn and there's hot chocolate and all the families sitting around the fireplace enjoying the warm glow of the evening, and you're creating a memory that's going to last in their hearts, in their heads forever, and they're going to remember this time together, this holiday, this evening, all because you sold them that quarter-inch drill bread. So that's what you're selling uh, in, your, in your copy, is you want to make sure you go to that depth in selling the transformation and laying out the transformation that's going to happen in their life after they make the decision to move forward with what it is you have to offer. And, and you know, the, the funny thing about that, too, is it, it, it all goes back to research because if you didn't get inside their skin and figure out what it is exactly that they want and what's missing, then you really can't create that experience with your sales message. No, no. One, one thing you did when I, I actually had a business selling to magicians uh, information on how to market themselves. And some people, and, and this, this is something I got over time. Uh, I got this from the guy I actually bought the business from, and he, he, he picked it out, and I, I built on it, is that you're not selling more gigs. Sure, you know, I want to make more gigs. You know, I get more gigs. Or maybe, you know, I want more clients, whatever it is. But with a magician, it's not more gigs. What it is, to a lot of them, it, it's confirmation an affirmation that this dream they've had for so many years that they could make a living as a magician is actually coming true before their eyes. So it's, it's, it's the, the, the feeling they get when their wife looks at them with appreciation for what they're doing, that all the sacrifice they made is coming to fruition and that they can have a, a great life and he can have the respect of, of, his, of his family and his friends knowing He's doing what he dreams. He's living his dream. Imagine what it's like to live your dream, you know, doing what you love, what you're passionate about. That's that. That's what you're selling. It's not, you know, a five-step toolkit for uh, putting up a website and booking more gigs. So now that we've gone over some of the core foundations of how to write a great sales letter, um, you, you've got a ton of experience as a magician, but also some training in comedy. And with my experience in magic, um, I, I think that there's a little bit of overlap between the two because they really both revolve around um, there, there's some type of story. And then at the end of the story, there's a surprise. And, and with magic, that's what gives you amazement. And with comedy, it's what makes you laugh. But would you agree with that? Um, it, the real key with, with humor, I think, is, is again, it's back to knowing your audience because the same things that will make one group of people laugh will not make another group of people laugh. Sure. Um, if I want to go, when I actually become a good children's entertainer, I'll talk, can I talk about that for a second? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'll get into the, phil the philosophy of my magic show. Uh, cause I was a children's entertainer, which is, uh, different than being, you know, an urbane, sophisticated, uh, nightclub performer. Or whatever. That's just not my style anyway. But for, with children, you have to understand where children are coming from and what makes them laugh. And I, I, I got this. I did a lot of research in it. There's people who are really good at this. So I stand on the shoulders of giants like all of us do. One of the key things children love is to see adults in trouble. <laughs> and because children are always the ones getting in trouble. Children, children are the ones who are fumbling and uncertain and not sure what they're doing and having it, having problems. So it makes them feel great when they see an adult in trouble. They also like see, knowing that they like knowing things that adults don't know also because they are, their lives are built under, you know, they have, they're always being told what to do and what this, having things explained to them. So when they have a, an up over an adult, that gives them pleasure and joy. So I reverse engineered and engineered my entire act. So it would be uh, an adult always in trouble and the children always knowing more than I did throughout the entire act. I wasn't doing magic. I was sort of there as magic was happening around me, not really under my control. Gotcha. 
So the entire the entire magic deck was based on that, and there was humor in that. It wasn't like didn't have to be necessarily a joke. It was more situational comedy. So they're seeing stuff that I'm not seeing. That's funny to them. You know that that is somewhat ingenious because it, it um like like with some of the stuff that that I did that I I, I wouldn't really call it a, a nightclub performer, but it, it was more um. It was more close-up magic, um, but it, but it it was stuff that was, um, yeah, I I don't want to say shocking because it, it wasn't more like the David Blaine type stuff where I'm putting a metal skewer through my arm, but it it was more stuff that was highly visual. So I had to become really good and proficient at sleight of hand, and you know spend hours doing the work that's required to get there. And and most of the time uh, I wouldn't have this issue, but you would always have someone either after the show and and sometimes people during the show would say, Oh, I saw what you did there. And, you know, talking about it as if I had performed it like you did as uh, you know, I don't know what's going on. This stuff is happening around me. It probably would have eliminated that altogether. Yeah. yeah I, that, that I really didn't have, I, I also, I, you know, again, this is, I'm kind of getting into the philosophy of my show. I, I became, and there are there are magicians and and no you are you know you know magic there there's there's schools of thought in magic about you know uh, strong magic you know I think Darwin Ortiz is strong magic great book uh, talk talks about you really want to just blow people away I mean magic if magic doesn't blow people away um, it's not really magic I mean I had kind of a different approach I I basically said I don't really care if I fool you my I want to make sure I do it. I did all the stuff necessary to be proficient so that people didn't catch me, what I was doing, but I got past the worry over ever being exposed and focused primarily on entertainment. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it, that's, um, I, you know, it, it's a, it's a much better way to do it. Cause I mean, that, that's why people really want to watch a magic show. No, no one likes to be, fold or not know what's going on so it was kind no. of counterintuitive but um yeah i mean uh, philosophy wise um the the school of thought that that uh i was kind of trained in with that was if if you want to create magic that, that seems like it's real defy the laws of physics so have stuff that floats have stuff that spontaneously can bust turn over a glass of water and not have it fall out, make yourself levitate, that, that kind of stuff. And then uh, obviously the make stuff disappear. But um, yeah, no, it, it's it's interesting that uh, that's the way that you had set up your show. Yeah, that, that, that was always my thought. So in taking it to Mark, if you're interested, that I was trying to think how I could apply this to marketing. It's really hard to bring humor to marketing. It's very, very difficult. It, I think it's best used... If you're not trying, you're not a. You're not trying to make jokes per se, uh, or be witty in your copy. I don't think that tends to work. What I think does work is if you can surprise people with what you're what you're saying, and you surprise people with the graphics you use. Uh, I like the. I don't know if uh, Bill Glazier's outrageous advertising. I don't know if you've read the book or seen the book fantastic book and i really take a lot of that stuff to heart like what can you do to stand out from the crowd and the big mishmash of crap that gets bombarded on people every day uh, that that to me is like a better i don't know if it's really humor but being creative and innovative and in how you present offers to people i am one of the great lines i got from dan kennedy where he said he was such a great copywriter, I believe it was because he said, I say interesting things in interesting ways. And that really stuck with me, that I look at everything I write. Am I saying something interesting, and am I saying it in an interesting way? And humor can be when you just take a little bit of an angle that somebody hadn't expected, so it's, a, it's an unexpected detour down a path people did not expect, that can bring an element of humor to your marketing. Uh, doing a goofy picture of yourself, you're willing to, if you're willing to, you know, in your marketing, put 
put yourself in weird situations. Yeah, I mean, Glazier put himself in a straight jacket. I mean, had himself on a camel. I mean, he had all kinds of – Dan put himself on a bull. I mean, he actually photographed himself on a bull. And that was classic. That still is trademark to some degree. So that's the kind of stuff I think where, where humor and marketing can really work. Yeah, you know, um, I, I was just reading in um, Brian Kurtz's book, uh, the, the the new one, the, the Advertising Solution. Um, he, mm-hmm. he talks about the Volkswagen ad that David Ogilvy did for Volkswagen. Um, and I, I think it ran in, in 68. I, I could be wrong on the year, um, but it, it was a Volkswagen Beetle. And it was a picture of the Beetle, and it was yellow. And the caption underneath was one word, and it said, Lemon. And it, he, he talked about how that's one of the only times um, and one of the only places where humor worked, but, but wasn't also detracting from the product. So I, I think that goes right in line with what you just said. Yeah, I, I remember uh, they actually, had, I believe they actually had uh, the Volkswagen floating, if I remember correctly. That actually was a... Uh, an old, if you can look it up, that actually was a, an old ad for the Volkswagen Beetle. At one point, they actually showed the thing floating. Yeah, well, because it, it was a play on words. Because um, you know, a lemon is a bad car, <laughs> and yeah, so it, it was um, it was one of those things that, like, because of the shape of the car and because of the people that liked the car and because it was a cult car, um, that was why it worked. But like, no one else could copy that for any other car. Oh, no, no, no. Well, Jack, we're about 26 minutes in, so I just wanted to see if there are any last words of wisdom you would like to leave the listeners with. Oh, okay. Um, probably, I guess, the only thing that uh, I think that um, the key thing, if you're, if you're a copywriter, I mean, I, the only hint I have for copywriters is just get out there and uh, meet people. Go places. My only, my only secret to having a job right now or having a business right now is I actually went out, and I'm not inherently the kind of person who likes to go out to events and hang out with strangers and talk to network and talk with strangers and everything else. But every dime I make today is because I went someplace and showed up somewhere. And uh, I think it boils down to this is, again, I'll go back to Dan. I think there's he's got his rules for success are be somebody, be somewhere, do something. Well, sound pretty simple, but they're really hard for most of us to implement and carry out. But I, I, I love them, and that, that's so true. You got to be somebody. You got to be somewhere. And you just got to do something. Yeah, you know, I I really like that because it, it's it's one of those things too that it can be so easily overlooked. Yeah, <laughs> we 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 don't. They all they all involve getting out outside your outside your comfort zone in one way or another. Again, it was just great being on with you, David. Uh, I don't have. I got lots else to say, but uh, we don't have hours and hours and hours. Uh, so if you want a little more hint of what I've, uh, what I write, what my writing style is like, or anything else, you get a check out my book on Amazon. It's 101 Fast Good Cheap Acts to Writing a Killer Sales Letter, or you could even just check out my website, uh, which is again sort of demonstrates the way I look at things. It's www.youdon'tneedacopywriter.com. Well, Jack, it was fantastic to do this interview with you, and I hope to have you on the show sometime in the future. That'd be great. All right. Great talking with you, David.